everybody, I'm Tom Vassell and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. I am glad you're with us today. This is a variety show where we talk about board games. I'm joined by a great group of contributors. This particular show is sponsored by Dawnshade, The Watcher's Prophecy. This is a game that's on Kickstarter right now. You can find a link in our description of this video. It is a cooperative JRPG, Japanese role-playing game, which I, uh, I really like playing those on uh, my devices. I love playing uh, Final Fantasy and uh, different games like that. And this one, you're protecting a young creature, Kimber, forming a party together, uh, trying to restore balance to a world that is being torn apart by two warring factions. Factions. This game has a bunch of really deep character customization in it and a big book, well, kind of a choose-your-own-adventure, big sprawling story. Um, uh, uses poker chips where you keep track of your health and stuff. And you have to go and look at the uh, website in the link to see more about the game. Also, I'm really excited, folks, to talk to you about the virtual gaming con that Dice Tower and Board Game Geek are putting together. We announced this last week, and this is happening on June 24th through 28th, which is a month from now. Uh, this is going to be where you can go online and using a piece of uh, a website and software that Board Game Geek has put together, you'll be able to go in and find other people and play games with them, whether that's on Tabletopia, Tabletop Simulator, on the iOS, just you talking talking through Zoom, Skype, and so this is going to have a cost which hasn't been announced yet that I know of, um, and, but if you were signed up for Dice Tower East or Board Game Geek Spring, then both of those, uh, all those people are going to come in for free. So even if you haven't signed up for one of those, you know there's going to be a big core of people already there playing games. So it's going to be exciting. Me and the gang here at the Dice Tower will be taking that week off from putting out content just so we can go in there and play games with you all. We're also taking that week off because we're preparing for the following week, uh, June 30th uh, through July 4th, where we'll be doing the Dice Tower Spectacular. There's going to be five top 10 lists coming out that week. I'm excited about those. We'll be bringing back Sam Healy for one of them. Um Efka and Elaine from No Pun Included will be joining us, and we'll have Eric Summerer and Mandy and others will be coming on board joining us for these top ten lists. Special guest Eric Lang will be there, and we'll just be doing a lot of different things live, and we hope you enjoy that. So that's coming up in the future. Alrighty, well I think that's it for special announcements. Let's get started with what I found on the internet. So speaking of things that I found on the internet this week, um, well, this one wasn't too hard, BGG Conline. Now I have to say when I first heard about conventions online when this, you know, everything started getting canceled, I was a little dubious, although some people are much more enthusiastic about it. Go see Ignasi saying that this is a requirement for the industry. There's no conventions this year, so we have to do online stuff and promote it that way, which makes sense. So one of the, there's already been a few that have been run, but BGG Conline just did theirs this past week, and you can go watch it on their Twitch channel. On Wednesday and Thursday they put these out. Uh, with they were showing off different games. It's very similar to the, the coverage that they used to do at conventions. I shouldn't say used to do. They do at conventions. Uh, Origins and Gen Con where they talk to different people. It's a, li a lot trickier considering that a lot of it is going to be virtual and stuff. But you can go and see the games. And they also opened up a store on their website where you could even buy the games that were talked about. Also, very interestingly, they had a discussion with some of the judges from the Spiel des Jahres. Those nominees were announced last week. And so they were able to talk to those, and you could. There were people who could go on and ask questions and things like that. So it's a really fascinating. Uh, I want to say 16 hours or so of content, and you don't have to watch all of it. I guess you can go around and look at the different stuff. And I would assume as time goes by that they'll be publishing it on their YouTube channel. But I like stuff like this. I find it fascinating, and I hope you check it out. That's BGG Conline. Link in the description of the video below. And Tyrant here. We are going to talk about Loot Island. This game is out a few years ago by What's Your Game, which is the publishers of Madeira and those heavy games. Yep. And don't let the size of the box fool, fool you. you. It is mm -hmm. What's Your Game level heavy for a box of this size. So, their level of lightness is 
this game. Yeah, it's a tricky little, it's one of those area control games where there's, you don't have many pieces that you're controlling. It is mm -hmm. essentially area control, but you only have three tokens to do it. Mm -hmm. You're trying to control areas, there are eight areas. Um, you're trying to find an area that has enough cards for there to be treasure present. Mm -hmm. And you want to have the bet, you want to be at that site. Mm -hmm and be on the bottom of the stack. In other words, have got there first to get the best pick of the loot. It's really tricky. It's very highly interactive mm -hmm. and you're going to have to see where your opponents are going and then what cards you're playing. And mm -hmm. uh, we play these two players and it has got this um, bot. Oh, I wouldn't say bot, like a... It's not a bot, it's a, um, a dummy player, a dummy player that yeah. is controlled by the mm -hmm. combatants. Yes. So it's got a very yeah sneaky little two player mode. It's really good. Like. You know, uh, some games with two players, it's like mm, whatever. But this is just giving you a different layer of strategy. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's about six different types of treasure that you can mm. be vying for. They mm. all score in different ways. They also come with curses, mm. and at the end of the game, you have to draft how oh, much yes. those curses yeah. are going to cost. That's a tricky you. one. So you could it could lose your game that way. So that's Lost mm. Island. So that's it. We are Maple University on YouTube and how to play videos in Pocket Playthrough on the Dice Tower. See you next time! Hey everyone! Today on 2 Minute Mini we're turning the Tinkerer from Gloomhaven from this into this in just 2 minutes. Hey everyone, Matt here from The Plastic Canvas and today on 2 Minute Mini we're painting the Tinkerer from Gloomhaven. Before talking about the Tinkerer though, I just want to say another big thank you to Stella and Tarrant from Meeple University for sending me some of their Gloomhaven minis to paint. You guys have seen them on Board Game Breakfast, but if you haven't checked out their channel yet, Meeple University, head over there to check out some awesome board game related content. Now the main thing that I want to talk about with the Tinkerer here is the way in which I needed to really focus on picking out out certain key elements to try and really break up the main brownish goldish sort of color that the Tinkerer is from head to toe. Here's just a quick look at the Tinkerer's artwork and you can see from head to toe he is pretty much just one color except for those couple of little blue lights here and there just to break that up. Now what I find with a mini especially at this scale, this guy is really really small, if you have pretty much one color it makes the details really really hard to see because they're already pretty small but also it makes the mini quite hard to read because you don't have one clear focal point to draw your attention and so what I really try tried to do here was pick out a few key elements so I could paint in some contrasting colours to make them stand out against the brownish bronzish colour to act as that those focal points. So you can see for example with that jacket coat sort of thing that he's wearing I painted that red whereas in the artwork it's brown. Red seemed to be a colour that made sense with this theme. Um, I made sure I picked out the different metallic elements in some different metallic colours so that they didn't all read as just one simple colour and you know doing some OSL there to make the lights that are, you know, on the different parts of him stand out and look like they're glowing. So that's how I kind of tried to break up those colours. So if you'd like to see the full version of this video where I talk about that in a bit more detail, head over to my channel, The Plastic Canvas, and I hope you enjoy your breakfast. Today, for my other thing that I'm reviewing, I'm talking about a show called Better Call Saul, which is a sequel to the show Breaking Bad. I never wanted to watch Breaking Bad, although the main character, I liked him because I enjoyed Malcolm in the Middle, so I wanted to see more of what he would do. Uh, but I did end up starting to watch Breaking Bad, and if you watch that show, if you're a fan of it, You'll know that once you start watching, it kind of hooks you in and sucks you down. When I heard that, you know, one of the main characters from that show, uh, better call Saul, or Saul Goodman from the show, uh, a criminal lawyer, not a criminal lawyer, but a criminal who is a lawyer, um, was very, very added humor to the show and added some levity and also another character called Mike. And these two characters, they weren't really always together. They had some connections and stuff. But anyhow, they were interesting characters. And so that character was strong enough that they decided to make a prequel. Now, I have no interest in prequels normally because I don't like watching a prequel because I'll sit there and see a character and go, oh, 
well, that character, I, I feel no, like, well, that character is going to die because I know whether they'll die or live. I know what's going to happen, at, you know, to at least those characters. So that kind of kept me from watching this. Also, I tend to not want to watch too many shows about anti-heroes, not even anti-heroes, but where a bad guy is the main uh, hero of the show. Breaking Bad kind of was like, ah, when I was done. It was a good show, but, uh, you know, I like to watch about heroes, I think, rather than necessarily villains. And the main character of Breaking Bad was a villain. Uh, um, in this case, there's two main characters of the show. The main one here is Saul Goodman, um, although he's not called that much at all in the show. He goes back to when he was just called Jimmy, uh, and uh, then and then Mike, and then these are the two main characters. And in fact, as you watch through the show, they kind of follow two different arcs. Their paths cross occasionally. I would say the scenes they have together could fill up maybe one or two episodes of the whole four seasons I've watched. I know there's five. I've watched the first four. Um, and so that's it, it's interesting that there's two different stories. I tend to like Mike's stories better because he's such a cool cucumber. He's a good character. He's hard-boiled. He has an interesting backstory. So when you watch him, it's like, ooh, here's action. Here's things that are going on. Now, I will say there's very little action throughout the shows at all. Action, when it happens, can be very quick, fast, and a lot of it's just talking. But there's also a lot of setups and stuff. And even though I, like I said, I think I like the mic section better, I'm really coming around to liking the other half too, where Saul Goodman or Jimmy McGill, uh, the main character, because he's a con man, and even though in real life I despise con men, uh, it's fun to watch him in movies, right? To watch their plans come together. And he pulls off plan after plan after plan in here. They don't always work. And the show does a really good job at introducing a lawyer in the first season who you think is a, kind of a pretty bad character. Um, and you grow a lot more sympathy for them as the series goes by. And then introduces a different sympathetic character who you tend to grow to hate and find out, in my opinion, they feel like the villain, the true villain of Saul Goodman's side. Um, and so there's some really strong emotional moments. And at the end of the day, after only seen four seasons, I think I like this better than Breaking Bad. It's more interesting to me. Uh, the main two characters are very sympathetic, even though you know they're both kind of bad guys and you know how at least one of them ends uh, in the Breaking Bad series. But I don't know. I find it much more fascinating. Now, there's still lots of slow moments. Uh, the directors still do their really weird camera angles. They love that, and they're always entered. They do some of the best camera angles I've ever seen in the business. But the storylines are well written. They get you to care about characters that you might not otherwise. And there's just a lot of interesting things that happen. So uh, it's definitely a show for adults. Um, there's a lot of lying and a lot of uh, yelling and a lot of breaking the law involved in it. Uh, but I, I enjoyed it, and I would recommend it if you like Breaking Bad. I think you like this. I don't know if you like one better than the other. I went into it expecting to like it less, but I like the sequel or prequel more, which I thought was odd. Hi, everybody. Hello. We are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right, so today we're going to be talking about Gulo Gulo. This game was published in the year 17 B.C., <laughs> <laughs> and it is no longer in print, shockingly. <laughs> so not really, but it is very old. It's out of print. We were able to find it at a garage sale. So we wanted to talk about it just in case you get lucky and find it at a garage sale or a thrift store as well. There was a reprint of this game or re-implementation of this game um, that Haba put out. It had like a, an Egyptian themed Pharaoh's Gula Gula. Pharaoh's Gula Gula, yeah. yeah. Um, so there, there was that that wasn't in 17 BC. <laughs> All right. So in this game, what's going on? Uh, there is this baby Wolverine. Okay, uh, this, is, this big plot, by the way, this big dramatic plot. He goes. He's hungry. He's got this. You know, he wants to eat all his eggs. He has no portion control whatsoever. He goes right for the nest. He gets caught by the vulture. Um, he has to get put in the vulture prison. <laughs> I don't know. And then all the rest of us have to go rescue him. But we're all eating eggs along the way too. And so. It takes us a while to get to him to rescue him. And so just like the baby Wolverine, baby Gulo Gulo, I have terrible porch control. I am greedy with food. <laughs> so what I'm doing right now is I'm going back to the basics. I am counting calories. I know it sounds boring, but I just need to take this time to retrain my brain into eating smaller portions. Um, so if you're like me, that's just one of your struggles. Take this journey with me. Um, maybe count your calories. Let me know how you're doing in the comments below. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see some results together. 
So Gulu Gulu has a dexterity aspect to it, which is really fun. You would think that dexterity, you'd be able to completely demolish your child. <laughs> However, that is not the case because it helps that they have these dainty little fingers that can do things that your big chunky fingers cannot do. And I view that as a good thing because it makes it competitive between you and your child. Yeah, there's also a really nice push your luck aspect to this game. You know, you can kind of choose which egg to go after, and that determines how far along this track you're going to go. Uh, but there's just some strategy and choices behind that. You might get a mystery one, and you might have to, you know, end up setting off this what they call the egg alarm, which resets everything, sends you back to the beginning of the board. So, uh, yeah, I like the choices in this game too. If you'd like to hear our full thoughts or to see our superhero Dodgers thoughts on this game, go ahead and find us on Facebook or YouTube under Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right. Well, thanks so much for tuning in, everybody. I will be a happy, healthy breakfast. Bye. What's up, everyone? My name is Melissa McCack, and this is Smashing Buttons and Slamming Cards. This is a segment where I talk about a video game I love, and I connect it to a board game I love. And this week, I want to talk about Nicktoons Racing. This is a game I used to play as a kid on the PC, and I loved it. You got to play as one of the characters from any of these Nickelodeon shows, be it like Recess or Hey Arnold or anything like that, and you're in these little contraption of cars that it kind of looks like the character themselves sort of made, and you're racing around all these different kinds of tracks, you're throwing different sort of things that people kind of like in Mario Kart in a way and I would like to connect that to steampunk rally the board game I was thinking about this game because because it looked like they were in their own little contraptions in the Nicktoons racing it kind of had that like steampunk vibe to me in a way and that's what steampunk rally brings to the table you're playing as some sort of inventor like Einstein or whatever um, and you are racing around this track by building your own sort of steam car which is really cool uh, through all these different cards with special abilities and all that those things and you're trying to survive really along this track because your car could get blown up you could uh, start losing pieces left and right it's got this wacky feel to it just like Nicktoons Racing did uh, and I really love both of these games anyway that's it for this week thank you so much for watching if you'd like you could check out mine and my brother's channel called Room 51 I'll catch you next time so what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, I'll be taking a look at several uh, new games. Uh, I have the new Funkoverse stuff, if you want to see uh, Jaws and uh, Back to the Future. One of those has just unbelievably cool mechanism, and you'll have to come and see the review to see what that is. I'll be taking a look at a few uh, games from Stronghold, a game where you cut cards up called Cutterland, uh, a really weird game called Tasty Humans, the Toy Story deck building game, and Hexplore It. So those are some interesting games, and I'm also going to be continuing on uh, with my, as I play through apps this week, I'll be doing uh, Puerto Rico, Charterstone, uh, Raiders of the North Sea, so those, uh, it's called uh, What's Happening, and basically I just play through a, a game on an app, you can watch me play it, we can talk back and forth, ask questions, and you see if I will continue my vast losing streak against computer opponents. Uh, we're also going to be foregoing a top 10 this week, instead we're going to do something different, me, Mike, and Z are going to come on and we're going to talk about all the games that have won the Spiel des Jahres and we're going to rank them and say which one is the best and which one is the worst of those games ish. You'll see how that works. That's coming up this Thursday. And of course, we have different videos going up. Manny and Suzanne have a podcast going up on Tuesday and many other podcasts from the Dice Tower Network. And then not just me, but Z and uh, Mike and Roy and all kinds of stuff. We're putting out all content all week long. We hope you enjoy it. And that's what's coming out this week. I'm Jonna from One Pip Wonder, and today, do I have a treat for you? I'm going to be showing you how to make your very own gelatinous cube Jello snacks. <laughs> if you're not familiar with D&D, there's a whole book of monsters that are written up for D&D sessions, and the gelatinous cube is one of the more hilarious foes you can run into, but. Nonetheless deadly. It's a giant clear cube that you can't really see until you're inside of it and, and then it delivers all sorts of acid damage to you while you're stuck inside. You can't breathe and you can't move. So it's quite a conundrum if you get stuck inside one. But ultimately it's a giant jello cube. 
To start off, you're gonna bloom the three tablespoons of gelatin powder in one cup of cold water. You're gonna let that bloom for about 15 minutes and that's just meaning you're kind of letting it get thick and gloopy. The rest of the water and the sugar and the flavoring you're gonna put in a sauce pot and you're going to bring this up in temperature to about medium high. You don't want it to boil, but you do want all of the sugar to dissolve and you wanna see whiffs of steam before it's done. Once that happens, you can add the bloom gelatin to the dissolved sugar and water and you can combine those together. Let your gelatin mixture cool for about an hour before adding miniatures or anything else to your mold. Once you have it poured, you can put it in the fridge and allow it to set for three to four hours before consuming so that it has a nice gelatinous wiggly structure. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope that you have fun while in quarantine and experiment with maybe some other fun game night snacks ideas. What have you been dreaming of doing once we can get together for game night again? Let me know in the comments. I hope you guys take care and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye. Hey everyone, I sincerely hope you're doing well. I've had the opportunity recently with a little extra time on my hands to kind of go back and rediscover a few older passions of mine and one of those is painting. So that kind of got me thinking that I own a lot of art games and I wanted to share with you my top three favorite. My first pick is pastiche. In this set collector, you're actually commissioning artists to make new works based on great masters. I love that it's got an easel for the board game board and it incorporates the works of the great masters so you can also kind of share things that you like with your board gaming friends who might not be as into art as you are. My next pick is Modern Art, the card game. And this one has another iteration as Master's Gallery, but I really like this version both because the art is spectacular and it's the very first game that my partner purchased for me when we started playing together. I don't generally like speculation games, but this one has a lot of really interesting ways for you to influence that future buy price that makes it a lot more interesting to me. My third pick is also my favorite Lacerda game, and that's The Gallerist. In this one, you're attempting to amass a fortune by running an art gallery, which anyone in the art business knows that's sort of like trying to amass a fortune in the board game industry. Um, it's got simple actions with far-reaching consequences, and when's the last time you played a worker placement in which you only had one worker? So those are some of my favorite games that are based on a hobby that I have outside of gaming. If you have a hobby that's outside of the board game sphere that you've kind of brought to your tabletop through a themed game, drop it below in the comments. I'd love to take a look. Have a fantastic week. If you like the content, check us out at Girls Game Shelf, and we'll see you soon. Bye. When you grow up as a child, you, uh, you know, you, the food that you eat is basically determined by your parents. So for example, when I was a kid, I never ate fish because my dad didn't like fish and my mom never made it. So I had fish on very rare occasions. I love fish now, as I found as an adult, but that's just how it was. I didn't know that steak was ever cooked anything other than well done because that's the way my dad liked it and that's the way we had it. And in fact, I had ketchup with steak occasionally. Now I know some people are recoiling with horror, some of you because of the way I, because I said ketchup instead of catsup, but others because you know you don't put ketchup on steak. And in fact, I don't do that now, but I, I know people who get like, well, how, how could you do such a thing? So I don't do that, but I do tell you something I do. I almost always use some sort of steak sauce with steak, and I often put uh, vinegar on my fries, or I'll put hot sauce on food before I taste it sometimes. I like sauces, and I like using them. Uh, when I was a kid, my mom also made us macaroni with ketchup. It was a bowl of cooked macaroni, put in some ketchup, stir it together. I thought that was a normal thing to eat. Come to find out, not many people do the same thing. Now, you... Certainly, there's a lot of foods that I ate as a child that I have no interest in eating today. A bowl of macaroni uh, noodles with ketchup is one of those. Ketchup with steak is another one. 
But I do find it interesting because in a, the board game hobby, I occasionally went to nice restaurants. People would take me out to eat at them, and there was this whole, if you eat ketchup with that steak, I'm not going to associate with you. This whole disdainfulness, I distinctly remember uh, one time I was at a restaurant, and the, uh, the cook asked me, I want my steak done, and I said, medium well, and he looked at me, and I was like, oh, what do you think? He's like... So medium. <laughs> I was like, all right, I don't know, you know. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I like for you. And that's why I think it's a little odd. Like, so I'll see someone eat something. I'll go, that's kind of gross. You put potato chips on your sandwich or whatever the thing is, whatever it is. I'm like, how? that's, ugh. you know, I can't believe you do that. That's fine. We all have different tastes. I don't prefer ketchup on my steak, but I do like steak sauce on my steak. That's what I like. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're different. And the fact of the matter is, I can be adamant on, I like steak sauce on steak. I feel like that's a fine thing for me to say. Steak sauce on steak is grits, the best. And you, you put ketchup, I don't do that. I think this is better than that. But your ketchup, if you want to put ketchup on steak, I'm not going to stop you from doing it. I'm not going to continue to yell at you. We might have a, a small, healthy debate about which one we like better. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to disdain you for it, which happens with, with steak, right? I found that these high-end steak eaters tend to disdain people who do it differently. And to what end does that do? That brings about this elitism. Again, you can argue over it, and I like those healthy discussions. Like, no, it's better. You know, if it's all good natured, it's, it's fine. But that disdain doesn't work. So where am I going with this? It comes to games. You might play a game with the wrong rules. Like, we often talk this about Monopoly, right? Someone doesn't like Monopoly will say, well, you're not playing it the right way. And so I'd be like, all right, we're playing Monopoly. If you land a free parking, you don't get money in the middle. It's just that's, not, that's how the game is played. And the people say, but that's the way we want to play. Like, well, we're not playing that way. Well, what, how is that helping anything? If I look at someone and say, you're not playing that right, you're doing it wrong. And even more importantly, you're doing the strategy wrong. That's a bad strategy. You're playing the game badly. You don't play your games enough. You play your games too much. You get too involved in the strategy, whatever. Again, I think we can have discussions about these sorts of things, but when we impose the way we like to play games on other people, that's where it becomes a problem. At the end of the day, if someone's putting ketchup on their steak, it doesn't affect you. And I know someone in the comments can be like, blah, blah, blah. that's just idiotic. It doesn't affect you. They could, they could just drink a bottle of ketchup. It doesn't affect you at all. And neither does the way people play games. It doesn't really affect me. I can sit there and go, well, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't, you know, make everyone keep all their information secret when it's clearly obvious who has what or what have you. But especially if it's their gaming table and their hood, so to speak, that I'm going into, then I should be knowledgeable that I should allow that. I should be willing to work with them. So, ah. Uh, I think sometimes we just, we, again, I, I'm not saying there shouldn't be debates about these things. That's fun to do as long as it's in good fun. But the moment I think I'm better than you because I play my game this way or I use these components or I play these types of games, that is where the problem happens. Ketchup on steak, not something I want to do. But if my son does it, it's fine. Roll and Write Game is really popular right now. Uh, roll and Write Game is similar to Yahtzee. It's the world's probably biggest Roll and Write Game. In it, you're going to take dice, you're going to roll them, and then you're going to write something. Roll and write. Now, a lot of games are called Roll and Writes, even if they just have that paper and pencil uh, aspect to them. If you search for Roll and Writes on Board Game Geek, they're usually found under the paper and pencil category, not Roll and Write. So, but. Railroad Inc. is a really popular one. I love Railroad Inc. You're going to roll some dice. The dice don't have numbers on them, of course. They have, uh, you know, roads and railroads, and you're going to draw them. A lot of roll and rights have numbers, colors, routes, Tetris pieces. There's a whole bunch of different ways you can do a roll and write game, but ultimately, roll some dice, write some stuff down. Flip and write game, or a flip and fill game, or a draw and draw game. Nobody says draw and draw, but these are games that are like a roll and write game, 
it still has that paper and pencil aspect to them, but instead of using dice as your randomizer, you're gonna use cards as your randomizer. You're flipping over a card and then you write something in. Uh, in, for instance, Kokoro, Avenue of the Kadama, you're going to be doing that. You're flipping over cards to draw routes on your board. The reason you would want to use card, these designs use cards instead of dice is that the randomizer is not going to reset each time. So whenever you're flipping over a card, the last card that was drawn is not going to be drawn a second time. Unlike dice where you, can, you could roll the number one five times in a row. It's unlikely, but it's possible. In a flip and write game, that won't happen. So that's it. Hey, Board Game Breakfast. So uh, I was working on a few reviews. I had the Battlestar Miniatures game, and then I had the Wings of Vengeance, which is the Warhammer 41K dogfighting game. And then I started playing them, and I started working on them, and I realized, man, this is like a different game. Then I realized it's Wings of War, the old World War I game, and then uh, the World uh, Wings of Glory, the World War II game. And I realized, you know, they're all the same thing, and I think each one of them fails in the same way. You, can you play three dimensions on a tabletop, a uh, two-dimension game? What if I'm flying around in my Mitchell Schmidt, and I want to do a barrel roll dive turnout? How, how do I, how do I do that with miniatures and and pieces and these little cards? And then it even got worse when I was playing the Battlestar game. There's some, some cool things like momentum and inertia is part of Battlestar Galactica tabletop game. But what if I wanted to thrust 90 degrees, then down, then back, then go straight? What if I wanted to attack like this? How is that incorporated into it? You can't. Are the same. You pick a card, you simultaneously reveal that card, you put it down, you do your maneuver, then you see if you can shoot each other. Am I lined up with a Cylon? Oh, yes, I can shoot, then I roll some dice. There's differences, but they're basically the same game. So my question to you, Board Game Breakfast, how do you simulate a tactical game on a tabletop. Is it possible with airplanes, spaceships, people, like a shooter game? Can you get down on a table and line up and see if you got line? There's games that do that and I've never really enjoyed one. I can't think of any I've liked. I've I played some doozies, but hmm, why do I like board games so much better than this style? I mean, these would be great to represent a fleet or a squadron of vipers, and I'd rather figure out if I can attack these Cylon Raiders with on a, on a board game where I'm looking at crew skills and uh, luck and surprise and then abstracting out the dogfight. The dogfighting part is cool for TV and stuff, but I don't think you can board game it. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. What do you guys think? Woohoo! That's the end of another show. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I appreciate everyone coming in and taking a look at everything and all of the contributors who did stuff. Don't forget, the show was sponsored by Dawn Shade, The Watcher's Prophecy. And you can check out, again, a link in the description of the video. So go check them out on Kickstarter. Not a lot of new games coming out right now, but there's some really awesome stuff coming out on Kickstarter. And like I said, the JRPG thing is a pretty neat concept. So I hope you look at that. And... Stay tuned. More information coming about the upcoming convention, online convention we're doing with Board Game Geek and our own Summer Spectacular. And of course, we got videos coming up all the time, even some more later on today. So until then, I'm Tom Vassell. You've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.